How bad's this bailout? Well, it's really hard to tell. It's a big fat document, 400 something pages full of uh, bells and whistles for special friends and favors. The worst part of it is I don't even really know what the Treasury Department's going to do, except it's supposedly going to buy some stuff, try to recapitalize banks, et cetera. What are the odds they're going to do it well? Uh, very low, obviously. They are part of the reason we're in this mess, they being the people who have set up the rules and regulations of the current system, which was designed to try to get people to buy a lot of houses with other people's money. And we've seen how that's turned out, and so I'm extremely pessimistic. I'm particularly pessimistic about what it's going to do to the capital and financial system of the United States, which basically channels savings into the hands of creative people. We have broken a number of the feedback loops that made that system work well, and so I'm, I'm quite concerned about the next, oh, generation. If we're going to fix this mess, I think it's important to understand how we got to where we are today. Uh, the standard answer is uh, it was greed run amok, markets don't work, we've learned our lesson, Milton Friedman was wrong, deregulation was a mistake, and it's time to get the government involved. Uh, well, there was a lot of greed, there always is. Wall Street uh, is based on high yield, that's the whole idea, but it's about prudent risk. The interesting question for me is what role did government play in encouraging risk taking that was with other people's money? Uh, there been a there's a bunch of stuff we've done over the last 10 years that has artificially driven up the price of housing. Uh, Fannie and Freddie, the uh, government-sponsored agencies, which had an implicit, now it turns out, actual guarantee to use our money to bail out their mistakes, uh, they were pushed consistently over the last 10 to 13 years to spend more and more of their money buying up mortgages of low-income people, which is a lovely idea, uh, but as eventually what that has done, at a minimum, is pushed up the price of housing and the demand for housing. We also had the Community Reinvestment Act. Yes, it was passed in 1977, so people say, I can't have anything to do with it. But as you'll read, if you look around, the Clinton administration strengthened it and greatly increased the pressure on banks to make loans to people they normally wouldn't make loans to, often backed by Freddie and Fannie. That was hundreds of billions of dollars. That also pushed up the demand for housing. We also had the 1997 Taxpayer Relief Act, which it made an enormous uh, reduction in the exclusion of capital, excuse me, an increase in what people could exclude from capital gains, expanded to rental and vacation houses, which also pushed up the demand for housing. And then we had in 2001 and 2000, 2002 and three, the lowest interest rates in 40 years. And a lot of those were for adjustable rate mortgages, which are now coming due as rates go back up. So government did a bunch of things that made housing much more expensive than it otherwise would be. If you owned a house, that was lovely. You felt yourself getting richer and richer. But that allowed people to feel very good about lending money to highly risky people. As long as housing prices are rising, they're less likely to default with no money down. If you put no money down and housing prices fall, or if the economy hits a bump, you're going to see a much higher default rate, and that's what is spinning out of control. So it's a combination of factors. It's not Fannie Mae by itself. It's not the Community Reinvestment Act by itself. It's not the capital gains tax cut by itself. It's not the cuts in tax rates by themselves. But those, along with some innovation in, in uh, securitization and Wall Street, which had many good things about it, unfortunately, has put it in our present predicament. What we're doing now is trying to figure out how to recreate that wonderful artificial market of, for housing instead of saying, let's learn our lessons and not have people uh, spend other people's money. It's a mistake. Well, what should we expect from the bailout going forward is an interesting question. Uh, it is, I think the most important part is not the budgetary part, although it's actually large enough that the budgetary part actually should be paid attention to. We're not very good at saying no in the United States. War in Iraq, okay, we'll do that. Uh, $200 billion bailout of Fannie and Freddie, oh, that's a good idea. $700 billion bailout of the rest of the financial sector, that too, what are we gonna cut? Uh, earmarks, that's $17 billion last year. Or Barack Obama, courageous maverick himself, wants to cut uh, contracting expenditures by the federal government by 10%, called a slash. That is $40 billion in a $3 trillion budget so far in counting, uh, that's not even a deck chair on the Titanic. We have to do something serious on the budgetary side. But the budgetary side, let's put that to the side. Let's just look at the incentives that the current bill uh, apparently does. What it does is basically said, says is if you made a big mistake and you bought a lot of stuff that turned out to be junk, we're going to buy that from you at a price that it's not worth today to make sure that your balance sheet can get healthy and the financial system will regain liquidity. The effect of that, of course, is to say to future investors, don't be as cautious as you otherwise would be because there's a chance we will bail you out. So the real cost of this to me for the American economic system, our standard of living, our way of life is we have said to people, risk taking is not as risky as it used to be. 
that's a mistake. It's a horrible mistake, and it will lead basically to a lower standard of living down the road because investment will be uh, more cavalier and less prudent. A lot of the people who want more regulation are the same people who want less money in politics. And uh, it's a noble goal, less money in politics, fewer special interests. People often forget that the reason that special interests are so powerful in politics is because government has so much power, has so many goodies to hand out. So if you're handing out goodies, people pay a lot of attention to you. It's just the way of the world. It's true in the private sector, and it's especially true in the public sector. So if you're spending $3.1 trillion, and if you are writing the regulations that affect people's lives, strangely enough, people have an interest in trying to get you to uh, change those rules to help them rather than helping others. Um, when people come home to me, they want to get money out of politics. I always say, make government less powerful. It works like a charm. And as our government has gotten more powerful, yes, money plays an increasingly important role. And it's not a good thing. It's a bad thing. I want to see power decentralized, pushed down to us, and away from them.